Chapter 16, Rashad, page 297. I learned that the night before a protest, it's impossible to sleep. I didn't toss or turn. I just lay flat on my back, staring into the darkness. My mind darting from thought to thought, from friend to friend, from brother to mother, from hashtag to hashtag. And in the morning, I wasn't groggy or grumpy or even sleepy. I was sick. And it was a good thing that I hadn't planned on going back to school until Monday because I spent what seemed like hours in the bathroom crapping nerves and pizza. Once I finally made it out to the kitchen, my mother, who'd taken the day off, was sitting at the table in her row, sipping coffee, staring at the television. Good morning, she said, then noticed my hand rubbing soft circles on my stomach. Her voice went into instant worry. What's the matter? Not feeling too well, I said, easing into a seat. Should I take you back to the hospital? No, no, I don't think it's anything like that, I hoped. Ma got up, pressed the back of her hand against my forehead, then to my neck. No fever, that's a good sign, she said, relief in her voice. She grabbed the kettle off the stove, lifted it to make sure there was water in it, and then sat it back down. She turned on the flame. I'll make you some mint tea, she added, reaching into the pantry to grab a tea bag and a mug. I bet it's just your nerves. You keep them buried in your belly. You got that from your daddy. What do you mean? I mean, whenever you get nervous, your stomach acts crazy, she said. Your father has the same problem. He can eat anything. Seems like his gut's made of steel when it comes to food. But when he gets nervous, he's a mess. I never knew this about my father, maybe because he never seemed like he was too nervous about anything. I mean, besides the story he told me about him shooting Darnell Shackelford, I'd never even known my father to show any sign of fear. But this new information got me thinking. He was sick earlier in the week said something didn't agree with his stomach. So maybe the thing that didn't agree with his gut was, what happened to me? Police brutality, maybe? Or maybe it was just seeing me in pain. Or maybe even knowing somewhere deep in the pit of his belly that I was innocent. Ma set the tea in front of me and then sat back down. We both sipped from our mugs and watched the news. Everybody was talking about the upcoming protest, which was scheduled to start at 5.30. Clips of military vehicles rolling past reporters talked about hopes for a peaceful demonstration. Police officers already dressed in military gear. I'd seen it before. I'd seen it all other times there were protests in other parts of the country, other cities, other neighborhoods. I'd heard Spoonie talk about it because he and Barry had taken buses to other cities to march. He'd been tear gassed before. He told me it was like someone rubbing onions on your eyeballs and then pouring hot gasoline down your throat. The word riots and looters were being thrown around in the conversation too. My picture next to Galuzzo's fashion across the screen, the footage of their arrest, looping, experts arguing. This isn't the first time this has happened, but until we have an honest conversation about prejudice and the abuse of power in law enforcement, as it won't stop. And unless you've been a police officer, there's no way to know how difficult a job it is. Law enforcement isn't perfect, but there are more good examples than bad. Is dad coming? I asked, holding the cup up. The steam snaked up into my nose. Ma pursed her lips. Baby, I don't even know. I woke up in the middle of the night realizing he wasn't in bed. When, he got up to, when I got up to check on him, I found him standing at your door, peeking in at you like he used to do when you were a baby. I didn't disturb him. I just crept back into the room. I was surprised he even made it up this morning for work, let alone a march. I was awake. I wish he would have knocked. I said, also surprised that he'd been watching me in the first place. I wondered, maybe he was reliving what it was like to leave me every day to be a cop, what it was like to love something enough to do anything to come back to it. Yeah, well, you know your father. Did he say something about it this morning? No, he just went to work early. He didn't say much of anything. Kissed me as usual and told me to be safe, but that was it, so we'll see. The smell of mint suddenly turned my stomach. Or maybe it was that my mother had just what it was maybe it was what my mother had just said, which made me imagine that dad had given her the talk. You know, never fight back, never talk back, keep your hands up, keep your mouth shut, just do what they ask you to do, and you'll be fine. Dad's guide to surviving the police. Dad's guide to surviving a protest. Dad's guide to surviving dad. Whatever it was, my stomach just started hiccuping again, jumping around like I was possessed by something nasty. I set my mug down on the table and ran back to the bathroom. Once I made sure it was safe to leave the toilet, I needed to go lie down. Who knew that lying down for a week could make you so tired? But before climbing back in bed, I got to, on my knees and reached underneath it, trying to grab a shoebox that I'd pushed way too far back. Ah, that hurt. Once I'd finally swatted it close enough to grip, 
I pulled the raggedy box from under the bed frame and set it on the mattress. I popped the top off and started digging through the hundreds of pieces of torn newspaper. My family circus tear outs. I don't know why I suddenly had to see them now, except maybe there were a little distraction I could really, really count on. I mean, I could have drawn something myself, but whatever was inside, uh, what was going on, what was going to come out. So I would have probably been another picture of someone getting slammed or something like that. So the family circus was better, easier. It had been a few years since I'd looked at any of them and leafing through them transported me back to sitting across from my father, licking marshmallows off the top of hot chocolate, reading them for the first time. Man, that seemed like a lifetime ago. Even thinking about it was like thinking about someone else's life, not my own. I mean, the innocence of it all seemed almost silly now. Think that, to think that life could be, always be as good as breakfast with your family and sharing the newspaper with your dad, looking up to him, imagining that one day you'd read the whole entire paper and drink coffee too. To think that my life could be as perfect as Billy's. I flipped through a dozen tear outs and then another and then I froze. Between my fingers was the one of Billy talking to his mother. It read, first thing you need to know is I didn't do it. I put it to the side and pulled out another. This one showed the little boy standing at his father's bed. His father's just waking up and the little boy says, put your glasses on daddy so I can remember who you are. And the other and another that simply said, Mommy, when am I gonna reach my full potential? They were still boring, still not funny at all, but I kept reading them. A simple and safe white family framed in a circle, like looking into their lives through a telescope or binoculars from the other side of the street, from a different place, from a place not always so sweet. I laid back in bed and continued pulling them from the box one by one until finally I drifted off to sleep. But it was only a short nap because before I knew it, Spoonie was knocking on my door. Little bra, you gotta get up, man. It's almost time to go, he said, cracking the door, peeking in before pushing it wide open, just as everyone had done in the hospital. He was dressed in all black, black hoodie, black jeans, black boots, a megaphone in his hand. Damn, get dressed, he said, followed by, what in the world were you doing? I looked around at all the scraps of comic strips littering the bed. Nothing, man, I said, sitting up. I'll be ready in a sec. I put on all black too, just seemed like the right thing to do, and met Ma, Spoonie, and Barry in the kitchen. Barry was also dressed in black. My mother, she had on her usual mom jeans, sweater, a light jacket, and sneakers. Oh, and a fanny pack. She was ready. They all were, but I needed to go to the bathroom one more time. Get it out, baby, my mama said, explaining to Spoonie that I'd been sick all day, like it was any of his business. But that's mom's for you. Funny thing is, I didn't even have to go. There was something else I wanted to do. In the bathroom, I stood at the sink, staring at my reflection. I brought my hands to my face and slowly peeled the tape and bandaged back, revealing my nose, still swollen. There was a knot on top, a lump that changed the way my whole face looked. I turned my head sideways. Bump looked even worse. I hated that damn bump, but I didn't want people to see me all bandaged up like that. Not because I was embarrassed. Well, I was a little, but most import importantly, I wanted people to see me see what happened. I wanted people to know that no matter the outcome, no matter if this day ended up just as another protest and Officer Galuzzo got off scot-free, that I would never be the same person. I looked different and I would be different forever. When I returned to the kitchen, when my mother, in, my mother instantly began to tear up, my brother nodded, balled his right hand in a fist and extended it towards me. You ready? I bumped my fist to his. Yeah, I'm ready. I couldn't believe it. We couldn't even get all the way to 4th Street because of all the people. So Ma parked on 8th and we walked down to join the crowd. English, Carlos, and Shannon all texting me that they were in front of Jerry's. We wove in and out of the herd, so many people, mostly strangers, but everyone was there for the same reason. It was unreal. Lots of people held up signs. Police officers lined the streets, creating all kinds of walls, containing, creating a kind of wall containing us. There were these huge trucks like road tanks blocking us at either end, locking us into seven or eight block rectangle. The newspapers were there as well. Men in gray suits and blue ties holding microphones in front of some kids I recognized from school. Stay close, Spoonie said as we pushed down Forest Street. He held my mother's hand and I kept a hand on her shoulder as he and Barry led the way. I was glad they'd done this before because my heart, heart felt like it had grown feet and was trying to run away from my body. As we moved through, eventually people started to recognize me and the crowd began to split open, making a clear path for us. 
I see Carlos, I said to Spoonie, raising my voice to be heard. There's English over there, Barry shouted back, pointing to the right. And there they and there were my friends, my brothers, standing in front of Jerry's, holding a big white poster board. Rashad is absent again today, written in bold black marker. They went crazy when they saw us, Shannon waving us forward like we were the royal family or something, making sure to let people know to let us through. When we finally got to them, they each hugged me, then my mom, and I looked out at the crowd, people, young, old, black, white, Asian, Latino, more people than I could count. It was a, it was a straight out of an Aaron Douglas painting, except there were faces, faces everywhere. My teachers, Mr. Fisher and Mrs. Tracy, Tiffany, who gave me a look, both happy and sad. Latrice Wilkes, oh my, my comrades from ROTC. And because it was Friday, uniform day, they were dressed head to toe. Some of the basketball players, football players, neighborhood people, Pastor Johnson in a suit. But this time, instead of a Bible, he held up a sign that said, Rashad is absent again today, but God is never absent. Katie Lansing was there. I didn't see Mrs. Fitzgerald, but I would have wanted her out there, even though I was sure it was tough enough to handle it that she would, even though I was sure she was tough enough to handle it. Um, but Clarissa was there, which was amazing. I waved to her, but the crowd seemed to think that I was waving to everybody and they all cheered for me, which was overwhelming. I knew it wasn't um, a, just about me. I did, but it felt good to feel like I had support, that people could see me. The chant was a simple one. I'm not sure exactly who came up with it. It just sort of started in the middle and rippled through the crowd. Springfield PD, we don't want brutality. Springfield PD, we don't want brutality. We chanted it. No, we screamed it at the top of our lungs over and over again as we started marching towards Police Plaza One. Spoonie shouted into a megaphone and he wasn't the only one. Everyone was on the same page, chanting the same thing as we moved down Main Street. Me, Spoonie, Carlos, English, Barry, and Shannon were in the front of the crowd. And all of a sudden our arms were locked and we were leading the way like the image came to me of raging water crashing against the walls of a police dam, marching. But it wasn't like I was used to. It wasn't military style. Your left, your left, your left, right, left. It wasn't like that at all. It was an uncounted step, yet we were all in sync. We were on a mission. And as we approached the police station, standing on the steps outside Police Plaza One was my father. Spoonie slapped my arm and nodded towards dad, totally surprised. My brother raised an eyebrow at me. I raised one at him. What? Then we were both grinned at the exact same time. Ma, of course, was crying. Instantly, she'd been doing a pretty good job at keeping it together, but seeing my father stand there waiting for us broke her. He jogged down the steps and met us with hugs. He didn't say anything, just hugged and locked arms with us as we turned around and faced the crowd, still chanting, Springfield PD, we don't want brutality. Spoonie gave Barry the megaphone and she started chanting through the speaker even louder than he had. He dug in his backpack and pulled out the papers, the same papers he'd shown us the night before at the kitchen table. As Barry slowly got down on the ground, she laid flat on her back, the megaphone still to her mouth, still chanting. Spoonie followed suit. He nodded to me. My father looked on, uneasy as me. Carlos, Shannon, in English, all laid down. My mother leaned into him and whispered something. The confusion slowly slid from his face and he took his wife's hand and helped her lower herself to the ground. Then he joined us as well. And the people in front of the crowd followed suit, realizing what was happening. The die-in was beginning and like dominoes, the crowd began to drop. Each person, young and old, lying flat on the dirty pavement, the police officers all around us in riot gear, their hands on their weapons, afraid and perplexed. Ladies and gentlemen, Barry shouted through the megaphone. Ladies and gentlemen, the chanting died down. We're here, not for Rashad, but for all of us. We're here to say enough is enough. We're here to say no more, no more. Spoonie gave the first paper to her and in her megaphone, she began. This is the roll call, Sean Bell. And then she followed with absent again today. Oscar Grant, absent again today. Rakia Boyd, absent again today. Ramarley Graham, she paused. And at that point, the rest of us knew exactly what to do. Absent again today. Ayanna Jones, absent again today. Freddie Gray, absent again today. 
Michael Brown, absent again today. Tamir Rice, absent again today. Eric Garner, absent again today. Tarika Wilson, absent again today. And Spoonie kept feeding Barry the papers one after another as she continued to read down the list of unarmed black people killed by the police. And I laid there on the hard concrete for the second time in a week, tears blowing down my cheeks, thinking about each one of those names.